Talking Point. Welcome to another episode of our show. My guest today is anthropologist Stefano Varese. He's a UC Davis professor emeritus in the Department of Native American Studies, Humanities, Art, and Cultural Studies, and the founding director of the Indigenous Research Center of the Americas. Professor Varese's research has centered on the native populations of the Amazon and of the Andean regions, as well as the population of Central America, Mexico, and the Western and Southern native regions of the Americas. Throughout his life, Professor Varese has been active in defending human rights and was a jury member at the fourth Russell Tribunal on Human Rights in Rotterdam and London in 1981. He was also awarded the Oxfam Latin American Studying Association Martin Diskin Lectureship for Activist Scholarship. During his long career, Professor Varese has held academic position at some of the most distinguished universities in Latin America and in the US. He continues to be active in teaching, regularly offering a UC Davis Summer Abroad course called Environmental Justice in Indigenous Ecuador. Professor Varese was born in Genova, Italy, and lived in Italy until he left for Peru to join his father, who had settled there. He is the author of several very well-regarded books, and today we'll be talking about his latest book, The Art of Memory. Stay tuned. Welcome, Professor Varese. Very nice of you to make the time to speak with me. So we're going to talk about your latest book, The Art of Memory, which is a fascinating book. And uh, I've read it, of course, but our viewers may not have. So can you tell us what is it all about? Okay, my initial idea was to reflect and write academically about what uh, took me from a kind of scientific, uh, social scientist, anthropologist into first an activist uh, using anthropology and my knowledge of indigenous people, initially of the Amazon, then of Mexico, Mesoamerica, and finally even of the US or the Latino population in the US. Uh, what took me from them and from there into participate more actively with the struggle for reaching more autonomous uh, condition of life and more autonomy in their political decision and their economic decision. And from there, I migrated into a more, uh, what I, call it spiritual take on indigenous people. What makes them different from us? What is the difference between a normal US or Latin American citizen, urban or even rural that has no connection to an indigenous past uh, as uh, in comparison to, to an indigenous individual, family, community, that is st still linked to their own past. And that uh, uh, is what I wanted to write about. And I ended up turning their writing and their idea of writing into a memoir. A memoir is not really a biography. Memoir is a selection of facts, events, and, uh, and little bits of memories that uh, occur almost not chaotically, but not in a very organized way in the mind of the main character. So I am at, a, at the same time a narrator and the main character. I narrate my own history and the history or the events in my life that, uh, that uh, occur to other people that are friends, uh, family, uh, lovers, and people even that I didn't particularly like at that time. <laughs> so 
the the book is, and that is because I called the uh, title the, the 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 art of memory because it's really an art. is a is a pick and choose and put in literary fashion uh, those events. It's, so it's not a language that is strictly academic. And I must confess that a very good friend of mine who was a professor of anthropology here at Davis, and now is a, a professor of anthropology at Columbia University in New York, Ben Orlov, famous Ben Orlov, who I met when he was a very young student in Peru, and I was already a professional at that time. I met him again here in Davis, and Ben wrote a, a kind of biography or memoir of his own father. And he insisted with me, why don't you write about your father? Why don't you write about, uh, basically about your father? And I caught that suggestion and I started to write and I ended up writing more about myself and the people surrounding me and the events surrounding me than my strictly my father. But there is something there. There is something there because my father left my mother and three of us, two sisters and I, when I was very young. I was 80 years old. And I, <clears throat> he left to go with a new wife. At that time was her new lover, his new lover, lover actually. And he ended up in Peru. And so I had this idea that my father had, which was correctly, uh, had abandoned me and abandoned my sisters and my mother and went to this exotic faraway place called Peru. Uh, Professor Verize, Stefano, may I call you Stefano? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, you, perhaps for our viewers, we should uh, mention that uh, you were born in Italy, in Genova, yes. and that your father, uh, left you and your sisters and of course your mother to go with his uh, secretary who became his wife later on yes. to Peru. And this uh, abandonment in some ways um, what marked your life and yes. your desire to go and uh, search for your father, isn't that right? That's, that's correct, absolutely yes. correct. Yes, and you also mentioned in one of your numerous presentations that uh, the book describes uh, your life in four basic chapters, right? Mm -hmm. And one is of course Italy, uh, post-war Italy and uh, your uh, vision of around you and your observations. And then the second part is Peru. Yes. Is that right? Can you tell us about how you ended up in Peru and yes. what you did there? I uh, ended, up in, uh, ended up in Peru looking for my father, basically. And uh, it was a, an, an encounter that was uh, uh, at the same time very emotional. Uh, but also very, very enlightening because uh, all the exoticism that I had imagined about Peru was real. I mean, I found a country that was totally different from the country that I grew up in, Torino, Piemonte, Liguria, Italy, Northern Italy, in post-fascism and uh, post-World War II era, because I was born in 1939, just at the beginning of the war, and the collapse of fascism occurred in 44, 45. And uh, what I would say, the, the increasing uh, globalization at that time, we wouldn't use that term, the in increasing internationalization of Italy, because the American brought the, f the famous Am Lira, the American Lira, and they brought uh, products that we didn't know. As a, as a child, for the first time, I saw chewing gum and so on. <laughs> and the broad jazz, for instance, I became passionate about jazz and, and so on. Uh, when I decided to go to Peru, I found kind of the same experience. I, I discovered a new world, a world that was in Spanish. Later, I discovered there was also a world 
in Quechua, the language of millions of people of the Andes in Peru, in Ecuador and other parts of the Andes. And I discover cultural differences. And that is what probably was the initial seed of my desire to become an explorer of cultural diversity and, and becoming an anthropologist, a cultural anthropologist. But I didn't know that consciously. It was through rediscovering my father, the new family of my father, my, my half brother, half sisters that were born uh, in Peru, uh, learning the Spanish, learning the culture of Peru, and becoming an explorer, uh, and uh, investigator, so, so to say, of Peru and my own family, because I had to know my father. So that is part of the initial motivation that is reflected in some of the chapters of the memoir. As you know, and the reader should know that the, the chronology of my memoir is very, um, uh, how, how could I say, is not, uh, a chronology that go from point A to point B to point C, from one event in one time to another event to, to another series of events in another time. Sometime in Mexico, sometime in California, sometime in Italy, sometime in Peru, in the Amazon, in the Andes, etc. And this is what makes the book extremely interesting. Flashbacks and uh, the the uh, sequence is more. Um, <clears throat> uh, from a thought and memory process rather than chronological, and it makes it very, very nice. I was particularly interested, well, I'm very interested in all your chapters of your book, but of course, uh, the way you describe post-war Italy and uh, your family and uh, your grandparents, yeah. and it is, it is wonderful. It's almost like a Luigi Pirandello without the, <laughs> without the drama. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> but little drama, but <laughs> yes. <clears throat> and my my refusal to to accept education, formal education, and my my struggle with education because I think I was dyslexic. Basically, I was a, a very dyslexic kid and sort of introverted. Introverted, but I found in the bookstore of my grandparents uh, a refuge for my dyslexia. <laughs> and so I explore a lot of books just by you know, spending days and hours looking at uh, a photograph and the famous encyclopedia, Italian encyclopedia, that is a monstrous encyclopedia, 40 something volume called Treccani. It's like the British encyclopedia. The, and, uh, and so my passion for reading, uh, although I had difficulty, as a, as a young reader, became also my passion for writing. And I, I think I mentioned in the memoir that there was a young, a young woman teacher that once told me, you have a certain gift for writing, Stephanie. I was very young. And I think it changed my life because I, I said, yeah, she's probably right. And so I, I embarked <laughs> on writing. <laughs> Stefano, um, in the book, uh, you also touch on uh, your activism and your passion for human rights. And uh, my question is, uh, what started this um, awareness of, uh, of the terrible inequality and uh, poverty uh, of uh, of the Amazon peoples, uh, or did it start beforehand? Tell us a little more about that, because I know that uh, all your life you've been active. And in fact, wasn't it true that you had to escape uh, Peru uh, when the government changed? So tell us a little more about all these adventures you had. <laughs> well, there are two events in, the, in my life that um, brought me concretely to the issue of human rights and uh, social inequality. One was that I was uh, sent by the Universidad Católica. I was a, a young student at the Católica 
together with a Jesuit friend that was also a student, to visit uh, an hacienda, which is a large estate owned by the church in Cusco, the southern part of Peru. And we visited the hacienda to issue a report for the church on the condition, social condition, economic condition of the hacienda as two young, not too experienced social scientists. And I returned to Lima and I said, this is, this is criminal. What's happening in Peru at that time in the hacienda run by the Catholic church was really almost a crime. I, we saw poverty, uh, hunger, uh, oppression, et cetera, et cetera. So that is the first event. And so I asked myself, what can I do? I mean, I, I'm an urban intellectual, I'm privileged, uh, I'm white in a, in, a, in a country that is all brown and black. And uh, what can I do with my privileges? And uh, that was the first event. And then when there was a social movement, political social movement, very progressive in Peru in 68, uh, I found the opportunity to join the government at that time. Uh, I was invited actually to join the government and work on behalf of the Amazonian Indians of Peru. There, there, are, there were at that time more than 70 indigenous, different indigenous groups in the Amazon region. Some very little, other huge indigenous group of 50, 60, 80,000 people. And uh, at that time also, there was a, a very important event that we are celebrating now, uh, its 50th anniversary, uh, 50 years anniversary, which was the uh, first meeting of Barbados. Barbados was is a little island in the Caribbean, invited a group of 17 anthropologists, most of them from Latin America, one from Austria and one from the US, to participate in a meeting uh, convened by the World Council of Churches in Geneva to look at the human condition, human rights of the indigenous people of South America. And so we convened, uh, we, each one of us brought a report on their own country. I brought a report on, on Peru, uh, others from Brazil, others from Paraguay, etc. And then we put together the, as a book and we declare, we wrote a declaration which has been known La Declaration, the Declaration of Barbados one. There were three, two other meetings of Barbados. Barbados two, Bar Barbados three. But that declaration was adopted by many of the indigenous movement in Latin America and made translating into their own languages and used as a tool because the declaration was saying that the, the oppression of the indigenous people could be uh, transforming their own liberation if they actively would participate in the political process and fight against oppression, etc. And so that declaration was also a motivation for me to keep working on the issue of human rights. Then the history of Latin America, many viewers may know, has been a history of uh, oppressive government and uh, oligarchy minority taking control of the economy, etc. And so I ended up working for the Guatemalan refugees in Mexico under the United Nations banner and the commission, the Mexican Commission for the Refugees, which meant that I had to visit a refugee camp in Chiapas, in Campeche, in Quintana Roo, where thousands and thousands of children, women, men were refugees of the slaughter and the genocide of the Guatemalan government. During, that was during the 70s and part of the 80s too. And then again, I found myself uh, having to uh, work in favor of re, re establishing or bringing back to our own uh, political situation in each one of our country and our own 
ethical decision, the issue of injustice, the issue of uh, discrimination. So that was then became part of my life as an academic. And in my classes, undergraduate courses, the graduate courses, I always emphasize that we have as a privileged social scientists that belong for chances of destiny or whatever reason, we belong to a privileged group of people that can think, can write, can read, has, have time to, to explore all the possibility uh, that we have in front of us as a human being. We have the, the duty, the obligation of being concerned about social justice. I absolutely agree with you. Um, are you still very active in uh, <clears throat> human rights? Um, you give us an example of where where you are working on but human rights. Now, I, I have, uh, well, first of all, in Davis, we have a substantial group of activists in human rights. And there, there is also a center for the study of human rights. And, and there is also a minor in uh, human rights that is uh, um, managed by Professor Lazara, uh, yeah. especially in, specialist in Chile. Uh, but uh, that is on the academic side. On the, on the, uh, my personal participation in that is uh, now oriented toward Ecuador, the Amazon of Ecuador. Ecuador is a country that is extremely interesting because politically went through a period of very innovative um, measures. There is, they have still a constitution that is an example of a very, very uh, progressive constitution that recognized the, the right of nature, for instance, the right of water, The water, trees, nature have rights. And that those rights can be brought before the Supreme Court and uh, is justified for people to bring the right of nature before the, the judges. So, but at the same time, the implementation of this beautiful constitution is always problematic. And so now I am working with a group of uh, community uh, of Quechua language that are located in the eastern part of Ecuador in the Amazon. Uh, the main community is called Sarayaku, the river of, the, of corn. Sara is corn, Yaku is water and river. And Sarayaku is a wonderful community, won a case in the International Court of uh, Human Rights or the Commission of Human Rights of the American uh, Organization of the American State, the Organization of American State, the OIS. And uh, the court decided that Sarayaku was correct in accusing or taking uh, the Ecuadorian government to court and they won a few millions of damage because they had the government that pushed uh, an oil company into the, the, the land and uh, using the land as a, as a, as a mining site, etc. So with that money and the victory, the uh, Sarajevo organized a wonderful uh, community. That is an example of what an indigenous group can do when they are given some freedom and some autonomy. And so they, they have created a, a wonderful, first of all, they have a lot of land. They have seven, almost 70,000 uh, hectares of, 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 of land. And they have, they have created what they call the, the the border of flowers, La Frontera de Flores. They are, they are surrounded all their territory with, there are 18 types of um, flowering trees in the Amazon. With those 18 types of flowers, so they will say, they are saying that in 30 years, we will see from the satellite view, a circle of flowers surrounding their territory. And they are totally autonomous. They don't depend on anything and anybody, but their own resources. You speak about uh, working with the native populations. 
in the Amazon um, for about four years, I believe. Uh, what I'd like to, to ask you is, uh, how can you describe your first encounter with these oh. populations? I was very young and I decided I had a, I was in graduate school and <clears throat> my professor, major professor was a French uh, professor, Jean-Albert Vellard. Vellard was a medical doctor who has a very interesting history. He, he came to, to Latin America with Claude Lévi-Strauss. When Claude Lévi-Strauss went uh, around Brazil, basically, in his famous uh, travel that then produced the famous book, uh, Tris Tropique, yes, yes. Uh, Jean Velard was the doctor accompanying the, the mission. Jean Velard was a very practical man, tall, uh, very French, that spoke with a heavy French accent when he was a professor of mine in Lima. Uh, he didn't have a, a mind for theory. He was a very practical, very uh, practical ethnographer. He was extremely detailed in the description. So he became my major professor and I said, I would like to go and do a study of the Amazon. And I said, and I cite that in the book. He said, you, Mr. Varese, because he was very formal in the treatment, you, Mr. Varese, are too impressed by what you read. You pay too much attention to. So don't read anything about this group that you want to visit. They are shining. At that time, they were called Kampa. And they live in the middle of a very isolated region called El Gran Pajonal, which would say it would be translated in English, the great grassland. An altitude is a, a savanna actually, in the middle of the Amazon, that is higher than the rest of the, the surrounding area. So there is less tropical rainforest and more uh, grass, savanna. And so that group sought refuge in, in that area is, a, is part of a larger group that lives in the lowland, in the river. And they sought refuge there after a famous uprising in 1742, who was uh, an attempt to free the entire region from Spanish domination. That was a, the Juan Santos of Tawalpa. And so I decided to go there and he said, well, you know, don't read about anything. Just go there, spend time with them, learn from them, try to learn the language, and then you can write about them. And so I did that. And I did that with my younger half brother, Luis. He was 14 years old. And I wanted to arrive to that place, not by airplane. There was a military airplane that once a week could fly to the airstrip in the middle of the Grand Pajonal. And I said, no, no, I want to do what the indigenous people did and what the first missionary did, which was to climb up from a river all the way to the top of, of this. And it took me three days, so almost, I almost died because I was so dehydrated and suddenly. But their first encounter was tremendous. It was a shock, cultural shock, because I, I saw the first a Shaninka coming through the Pajonal. They were all painted in red. They wear a, a long tunic. There is a brown color, sort of brown color. They, they were, the male were long, long ears. They had all balls and arrow in their hand. Winchester, all Winchester uh, rifle in the other hand. <laughs> and I was absolutely astounded. <laughs> And, and I started to understand that they are very peaceful people, actually, and they are very spiritually oriented. That was my initiation into cultural anthropology of the Amazon. What uh, type of religion do they have or how mystical they are? Very mystical. It's a very, <clears throat> I have a few pages there that actually I revisited the issue of their spirituality as I was writing the book, 
because lastly, I have taken the, I unconsciously made the decision that uh, to return to my first intuition, that was that uh, Shining at the Kampa was so uh, successful in resisting uh, the oppression and resisting, not the oppression, but resisting the, the deculturation that they could suffer, uh, that they were suffering because of the mission, missionaries, because of the uh, sellers. Uh, the, the success was due to the fact that they are very strong spiritual. They know exactly what their position in the universe is, what their position in the, what they call all our relative plants, animal, insect, fish, water, mountain, salt. It's very important, the salt for them. The book, my dissertation became a book called La Sal de los Cerros, The Salt to the Mountain. Salt yes, to the Mountain. And this is one of your books, uh, your yeah. first book, isn't it? My first book. My yes. dissertation, actually. Very well received. It was very uh -huh. in, uh, insightful. Yes. And, uh, and what, what I did. Yes. Yeah, what I discovered is that the importance of the salt was not only commercial, because they were, the salt was going from the Sal de los Cerro in the center of Peru, sometime all the way to the lower Amazon to tribes that didn't have access to salt, because salt is a scarce commodity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Amazon is very scarce. Some tribes rely only on ashes of plants that they burn that have contained that contain some salt. Other have to rely on trade. So I, I get salt from you, uh, and and I can give you I don't know a chote paint for the face and so on. And so, but what I found out is the salt is also a mystical. Um, symbology and importance it was is it, is a sacred element. Is what connect them to divinity, to deity, to spirituality. That they they are, a, and this is common in cosmology of Amazonian people. That everything is related. Everything is a network of relation. That's why they call them our relative. Mm -hmm. This is my brother, this is my sister, this is my mother, this is my daughter. So a plant becomes a member of the family. A salt is a member of the family. Uh, and all that is uh, coded in the language in the, in the way things are treated linguistically, then intellectually and emotionally. Mm -hmm. And that is what constituted the force, the strength of these people to resist imposition from the outside. And the materialization and individualism that is the tool of Western, modern Western modernity yeah. to, to destroy the other. To... Extraordinary people. Let's talk about uh, the food. <laughs> How did you survive? <laughs> what do they was... eat? <laughs> <laughs> they, the diet in this particular area is based on uh, yucca, bison. which is bison. No, a yucca is a is a is a, a root. Uh, called, uh, the botanical term is uh, is uh, uh, well, come on. Uh, let me let me think about. Yes, it's, um, but it's, no, I forgot it at this moment. Yes. But it's a it's a root that grows between six and seven, eight, nine, 10, 12 months into a huge uh, tuber. Tuberous, yes. You, you treat that, you roast it, you boil it, or you <clears throat> uh, create a kind of beer, which is called masato, piarinci, uh, which is uh, very uh, nutritious, mm -hmm. but it's also inebriating, has two degrees <laughs> of alcohol. So they do that every month. They produce huge amount of masato. And then they have a party, collective party of three days or three nights, four days, in which they ingest tremendous quantity of it. So that's, that was my initiation. 
One time I was having a party with them, fiesta, dances, etc. And they put some tobacco juice, but <laughs> Nicotiana Rustica, which is a tremendously strong tobacco. And I lost consciousness for three days. Three days. I, I was somewhere else. And I went and sought help from the uh, Protestant missionary that had a base like two or three hours from where I was. And I went and there were two missionaries, two ladies, American, that they didn't help me at all because they are against the, against the use of alcoholic beverages and what they consider drugs, tobacco, and even uh, puritanical kind of missionary. <laughs> so they abandoned me into my vomit. I was vomiting my brain. I was so awful. <laughs> Not for the spirit. That was my initiation into the power of certain, uh, certain uh, food that are considered, considered ritual. They are ceremonial food, actually. It's like coca, no? It's a, yeah. it's a sacrament. So. <laughs> My goodness, I'm very <laughs> glad you survived. <laughs> and I, I survived, and, and then I learned how to use uh, with them, and and later with other uh, people, uh, ayahuasca, which is the the most powerful, one of the most powerful psychotropic uh, plants of the Amazon, of the actually, I would say, of the world. Uh, ayahuasca now, unfortunately, is spreading throughout the U.S. as a as almost a drug of um, pleasure, but it's wrong. It's a it's a sacrament. It's a sacrament used by shamans mm -hmm. in a very special way. You have to fast in order to to have it. You have to abstain from every relation with other people and for months actually, and you have to be. It's a mystical experience, mm -hmm. and the vision reveals what uh, what you have in your mind, what you have in your heart, and what other people. It's a very intriguing thing. You know, there is a, an author, professor at Berkeley, Michael Pollan, that recently published a very interesting study, not only on ayahuasca but on peyote too, which is another psychotropic plant of uh, mm -hmm. Mexico and South. How did you communicate with them? You understand? I understand they have their own language. Um, yeah, yeah. They learn it. It, it. And did you make friends? Uh, yeah, I, I had very good friends. Actually, uh, Omaga or Juancito uh, at that time was a, a boy in his 14, 15, uh, was my translator, my teacher, actually. Mm -hmm. I use him to help me to understand. There were no written uh, manual about the language. Language was totally an oral language managed only by the Ashani. Mm -hmm. So I had to start from scratch. Right? Mm -hmm. And I was, and I have to confess, and this is a confession that I did many other times, that I never became very proficient in the management of the language. I rely very much on Omaga and tape recording. So all the, all the record of the mythology, uh, the Cosmovision, et cetera, I had to tape and translate. Later, I found a, a speaker of uh, Ashanika or Nomatsigenga, which is a related language in Lima. He was a former member of the army that was brought into Lima and abandoned there as an ex-soldier. And he was a worker of the construction work. And I brought him to the university and I found a little bit of salary at that time to pay him as a post translator informant. And so with him, I went over my old notes from the field and we rewrote uh, some of my notes that were in Ashanika, taped in Ashanika and then translating into Spanish. And with him, I published a very important article. <laughs> his co-author, Moises Gamarra was his name, yeah. and published in a very famous French journal, Les Annales, uh, <laughs> uh, a journal that was founded by 
Fernand Brodel, uh, Henri Piren, the famous historian uh, of France. Yes. He was, uh, they, and he's still there. <laughs> I found it when I was in France, I went to the library <laughs> and I found it uh, actually posted. So, oh gosh. And I didn't have a copy of that. <laughs> now I'm <with> my computer. <laughs> what a very interesting uh, life you've had. And so it's, it's wonderful to see the passion that you still uh, carry for this field and, and for the culture of people. Um, there are other uh, topics that you uh, write about in your book. And uh, I particularly liked uh, the, uh, the part where you talk about your wife, Linda, mm -hmm. and uh, how, how did you meet her? Is she an anthropologist as well? Well, she, <clears throat> she's in, by, un, her undergraduate uh, was in psychology. Then she earned a master's degree later in education. But uh, at that time she was, uh, just out of school, out of college. Uh, and uh, uh, she was working for a pharmaceutical company of suspicious <laughs> origin <laughs> that was collecting, uh, at that time, anti-fertility oh. uh, plants. Because at that time, there were not pills yet. The yes. pills were, appeared much later. Yes. And so she was collecting uh, plants that were uh, thought to be anti-fertility plants taken by the women of tribal people, uh, people in the Amazon. So she, were, she went to a couple of tribes, the Machigenga and the Ashaninga and the Shipibo, collecting these plants. And so she came to visit me. At that time, I was in charge of uh, an office that would... Uh, address the issue of uh, indigenous people of the Amazon in Peru. And she came to the office. She introduced herself, I'm such and such. I was astonished by her beauty. She's absolutely beautiful woman. And I said, well, I had to meet this woman sometime out of this office. <laughs> Secret <laughs> thought of every single <laughs> human male. And uh, she went to a place that was not even in the Peruvian map. She showed me a map that was a map produced by the CIA. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have that map. She said, I want to go to this river, Pitch. And I said, there, there isn't such a river. Where is this river? And she showed me the map. There wasn't a river, Pitch. And she went there. And she had an incredible adventurous trip. And then she came back and we visited and we made friends. And there was an important national, international conference of the Americanists at that time. And uh, I was uh, appointed part of the panel there. And she came and we established some wonderful French uh, friend relationship. Then she went back to California and then she came the following year, and then is where finally we decided that it was a good opportunity to live together. And uh, ever since has been a wonderful relation. Awesome. Out of time. And this was a great pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Lee.